Okay, we're just waiting for our live stream. Still waiting for our live stream. Okay, we're good. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first planning committee meeting of 2021. Um, I am going to call us to order at 9.05. We are actually missing two councillors at this point, but we have quorum, so we're going to start and carry on. Uh, this this um, meeting is being held in accordance with Section 238 of the Municipal Act 20, 20, 2001 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm, I'm confirming that members um, present uh, to confirm a quorum, we have uh, 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 Councillor Hayes and Councillor Nishikawas uh, are not present, but we do have a quorum. Um, the CAO, our Clerk, Director of um, DSES, I'm going to shorten that forever to that, and other members of the staff are present. And I don't believe we had any comments coming in through planning for this meeting and nothing from the main mailbox. And just the other uh, housekeeping item motions uh, have been pre-populated with random movers and seconders to expedite the meeting. And voting uh, shall be by physically raising our hands and the chair will confirm the vote. And if it's unclear, then we will call a vote, but it won't be considered a recorded vote. Okay, and there are no, there is no supplementary agenda today. And is there any disclosure of pecuniary interest? Uh, Councillor Roberts. Yes, um, with the official plan um, item that's gonna be presented by Leonard Lake, I'm going to um, declare a conflict of interest with that one. Sorry, sorry, and, and the reason Councillor Roberts? Um, I contributed to the Lake plan. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, are we good? Oh, pl and and please submit the form. The clerk is just reminding you that you need to submit that form to her. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we're going to get started. Then we have one uh, public meeting today, which is item five D, and that is live group or live group investments, and that would be Mr. Sharp. So, Mr. Sh good morning, Mr. Sharp. If you'd uh, take us through, that would be great. Good morning, Chair Bridgman, members of Planning Committee, applicants and agents, and members of the public. The first application to be heard is Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application ZBA 26 20 in the name of Live Group Investments Limited. The subject property is known municipally as Ferry Island J12 1. I would direct committee's attention to the zoning sketch and draft elevations beginning on page 33 of your agenda package. The purpose and effect of the application is summarized as follows. The subject property contains a two-story dwelling with an associated open porch and stairs, two sleeping cabins, a pump house, a privy, and a dock. Existing buildings and structures are proposed to be demolished. A new dwelling, sleeping cabin, sun decks, Stairs, landings, walkways, pump house, dock, and a single story boathouse are proposed. Where a lot zoned waterfront residential WR4 is located on an island, the <clears throat> lot itself must have at least 100 feet of lot frontage and at least 15,000 square feet of lot area and must be located on an island with at least uh, two acres of lot of, of area. In this case, the lot comprises the entirety of Ferry Island which is 1.9 acres in area. And the lot is therefore considered undersized and does not constitute a building lot. Bylaw 2020-121 will permit new sun decks, stairs, landings, walkways, a pump house and a single story boathouse to be constructed on an undersized lot. The bylaw will also permit an existing two-story dwelling to be enlarged and relocated and a sleeping cabin to be reconstructed on an undersized lot. 
the minimum permitted front yard setback for a new sun deck is 50 feet. Bylaw 2020-121 will permit two new sun decks at setbacks of 25 feet and 44 feet respectively. Notice of this public meeting under the Planning Act was circulated 20, 27 days in advance and five submissions have been received to date. The first submission is by the District Municipality of Muskoka's Planning and Economic Development Department. In summary, district staff would not be opposed to the approval of the application provided that appropriate development control techniques are used to protect water quality, to direct shoreline structures outside of sensitive fish habitat and to conserve deer wintering habitat. District staff have requested to be notified of council's decision that is signed by Cassidy Fior, district planner. The second submission is by Nick Snyder, the township's chief building official and Mr. Snyder has advised that he has no comments. The third submission is by Tim Sopko, the township's public works technician, and Mr. Sopko has indicated that the public works department has no objections. The fourth submission is by Susan and Jacques Demers, who are landowners on Arma Island, and they have indicated that they have a clear view of Ferry Island from their property and have no objections. The fifth submission is by James and Lizanne Rogers, who are area landowners on Cameron Island, and they have indicated that they have no objections. I have prepared a detailed report for committee's consideration. I would note that staff circulated worst case exemptions. Ferry Island has been surveyed at 1.9 acres in area and the proposed sun decks are intended to be set back at slightly greater distances from the high water mark than indicated in the public notice. Staff have also been informed that the proposed dwelling is to, intended to be a two story uh, dwelling over one portion versus a single story dwelling as was indicated in the public notice and the submitted application. I have no further comments at this time and I'm happy to assist committee with any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. Um, would we have uh, the, a, we have a planner that is gonna speak for this? The agent. the agent? Yeah. Oh, Kelly. Okay, Kelly, uh, just uh, coming in now, Kelly Hodder to speak for this application and introduce it. There she is. Okay, Ms. Otter, if you'd like to continue. Yep. Good morning. Kelly Hodder, planner with Planscape, 104 Kimberly Ave Bracebridge, P1L1Z8. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Uh, so good morning. I'm here today with Richard Ivey, who has owned Ferry Island for many years, and project architect Jim Ireland. First of all, thank you to staff for the report. I generally agree with its findings. Um, I just wanted to confirm, uh, we understood there were supposed to be three letters of support from neighbors and also wanted to uh, confirm that the owner has pre-consulted with uh, five of his neighbors. So we've done our due, due diligence on that aspect. Uh, the purpose of the application before you is to permit the construction of a new single story boathouse with associated dock and pump house as well as to permit the reconstruction of a two-story dwelling and sleeping cabin on a slightly undersized lot. The proposed boathouse will replace the original boathouse and dock, which were demolished with the approval of the township several years ago due to safety concerns. The owners wish to construct the replacement single-story boathouse and dock in a different location on the property, as the current location is shallow and surrounded by hazardous rocks. The proposed two-story dwelling, which replaces the existing two-story dwelling, is to be located in generally the same location as the existing dwelling and sleeping cabin. I would like to point out that when we submitted the application in October, the only amendment that was required was to construct a new boathouse and docks on an undersized island, given that the existing one was removed several years ago. The proposed replacement dwelling and sleeping cabin complies with all other zoning bylaw provisions. The variance for the sun deck was added later after determining the front porch of the existing dwelling did not reconfer development rights. In December, with no warning to us, a requirement was opposed, imposed to include all variances for all structures proposed for the property. The island was recently surveyed at an area of 1.86 acres merely 0.14 acres or 600 square feet short of the required two acres. To address the boathouse, I would like to note that it is proposed to be single story 
and along with the associated docks, complies with all bylaw provisions, including length, width, and height. The boathouse and docks are actually being moved away from the type one fish habitat located on the east side of the island. They will be located in an open fetch of water with no near neighbors to look directly on the structure. Regarding the cottage, the front yard setbacks have been increased over what currently exists with only a small portion, less than 300 square feet, located within the 50 foot front yard setback. Only small portions of the dwelling are proposed to be two story as you can see in the elevation drawings. The property is well treed with a fully naturalized shoreline. Approximately eight trees are proposed to be removed for the entire project as the majority of the construction will occur within the footprint of the current structures. We have no problem with submitting a site plan to ensure no additional vegetation removal occurs. Uh, I respectfully request this application be approved and the bylaw as proposed be amended to refer to a two-story dwelling as opposed to a single-story dwelling. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I believe both Richard and Jim would also like to address planning committee. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we have to bring them in so there'll be a slight pause here. I also like James Rowe Yeah, that's fine. Um, uh, bring him in after. Can you please? Thank you. It's okay. It's okay, we have a technical pause here. Just for a minute. Okay, Mr. I see you, Mr. Ivy. There you are. If you could just state your, your name and address first and then please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm pleased to be here. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yes, my name is Richard Ivy. I live at 8 Highland Avenue in Toronto, M4W2A3. Uh, my family and I are the sole owners of Live Group Investments Limited, which is the applicant uh, here today. We are longtime uh, residents of uh, Muskoka. We rented on Loon Island, the next island over, uh, from 1990 to 1995. In 1994, we purchased 40% of Loon Island next door and we uh, built our existing cottage in 95, 96. It is invisible uh, from the lake and the two-story boathouse is as plain and simple as any in uh, Muskoka. In 2004 or so, we purchased Ferry Island for both protection and family planning purposes. Our family has uh, matured over the years. I now have uh, a daughter married with a child and another one on the way. A second daughter is engaged and I have a son and they all love the cottage and it's getting a little crowded and uh, busy for uh, grandma and gramps. Uh, fortunately, we are in the position of being able to afford to build a new small cottage for granny and gramps to hide out in on Ferry Island. And like, like on, it, it too will be plain and uh, simple and not draw attention to itself in any way. And like on Loon, the only interference uh, with the shoreline's natural habitat will be the boathouse and accompanying dock. Thank you for your consideration of our application. Okay, thank you. And did your wife wish to speak too? Did I understand Kelly properly? Uh, no, she's not in attendance today. Okay, that's great. So um, thank you. And anyone else who would like to speak for this application? Uh, I would. Please. So this is Mr. Ireland who is yes. speaking now. Yes, yes um, Mr. I yes. Mr. I Ireland. Okay, great, Mr. Ireland. Go ahead. Um, 
I'm, I'm Jim Ireland, and uh, my firm is James Ireland Architect, Inc., and I'm at uh, 68 Marmaduke Street in Toronto. Um, I just give, like to give a little bit of background to the design of this, this project. The island has had for a long time a two-story cottage very close to the shore, a boathouse, docks, bunkies, and a few sheds. And considering how to develop the island for future use, we wanted to adhere to the main restrictions of the zoning bylaw and to keep the visual impact of the buildings mi minimal. The reason for the current application is that despite the long-term inhabitation of this island is slightly smaller than the bylaw dictated lot of record. We have been allowed to, by the bylaw to grandfather the proximity to the water's edge on account of the old cottage having, old, old cottage, but we've pulled the new cottage further back into the trees than would be required. The portion of the building closest to the water is just one story high. The two-story portion is well short of the allowable bylaw height. Our intention is to keep as many trees as we can between the building and the shore, leaving most of the shore in a naturalized state. The building as a whole is on the far side of the island from the closest shore, which is Loon Island. The previous boathouse location was, as Kelly said, uh, was in unsafe water, and the new location was chosen to also keep the buildings on the opposite side of the island from uh, Loon. And an alternate location which would have suited the new cottage design would have been the west shore. This location would have placed the side of the boathouse in full view of the north end of Loon. We decided on a position at the southwest extremity of Ferry, which mostly hides the building from Loon and keeps it uh, from being directly in front of the proposed new cottage. The new boathouse is a low one story, except for a slightly raised Clara story in the portion closest to the land. At some point, there may be a bunkie built, but that would be set back according to the um, 66 foot um, uh, required setback from the west shore. And it would be hidden by trees and no, no dock is uh, ever planned for that um, west shore. Thank you very much. That's all I wish to say. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and James Rowe, okay, there's another speaking. Excuse me for this application, Mr. Rowe, I think you're just coming in. Okay, J James, yes. Can you see you, me? We don't have video, but we do have audio. Oh, okay. I'm not sure what's up with that, but um, uh, can I continue anyway? Uh, yes, certainly you can. Please just give your name and address before you your comments. And go uh, ahead. I'm James. I'm James Rowe. I live at 239 Riverside Drive, Bob Cajun, K-O-M-1-A-O. Um, I'm just here representing the, the public. Um, we don't want to stop the development. Um, we only want to save the existing cottage. Um, I have a small two minute speech, so um, I appreciate if you listen to it. Thank you. Um, when you think of a city, country or town, Architecture and buildings often first come to mind. Ask anyone to think of Canada, you will often get an image of wilderness, lakes, and wildlife. Muskoka holds these qualities, and our unique wood architecture through time also holds this identity of Muskoka and Canada. Muskoka is an escape from urban areas to experience the Canadian wilderness. The idea of a vast network of lakes being so close to metropolitan areas has been desirable for the past 150 years. People of urban Canada and America around the turn of the century were wanting to experience the pioneer life in the woods. Muskoka was the perfect frontier for this experience, though much different now, still continues today. In my job, I hear stories from cottage owners and you can see people um, are proud, <clears throat> sorry, you can see people feel they're part of something special here. No matter how long they've been here, people are proud of their family and property history. More often, embracing this history is forgotten. And as a result, we have lost a large percentage of early, lakes, early lake buildings and cottages in the last few years. We aren't against development. It's exciting to see and supports our economy. But why should it be at the cost of our history? Canadians hope to see a Muskoka with the old and the new side by side. Places like this will embrace, will be embraced and recognized, but will likely be gone before we see these qualities. Look at the Eiffel Tower. 
It was once just an old rusting tower in Paris that they wanted gone, though the people ended up saving it, and now it's a symbol of their French identity. Though this building isn't the Eiffel Tower, one day these places will be far more appreciated beyond a dollar value. Cumulatively, places like this in Muskoka will help symbolize our Canadian and Muskoka identity. I respect the development and I'm hoping to hear, and, I hoping, and I'm hoping you can hear what I'm saying. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone else who would like to speak to this? Opposed or whatever. So Mr. Uh, yes, I was just going to say, Mr. <clears throat> excuse me, the applicant now has the ability to answer what you just heard. So please do. Um, I respect uh, Mr. Rowe's position. This is a total surprise that he was uh, appearing today. So um, I'm not exactly prepared, but I can tell you that after we purchased the property in 2004, it was rented uh, by the former owner and then by friends of his for approximately four or five years. Uh, then in 2009 or 10, um, I had my contractor, Harold Blower of Rose Point Contracting in uh, Perry Sound come down. Uh, he's the fellow who built my cottage on Loon and assess the situation of the, the two buildings, the two principal buildings on Ferry Island that exist now. One, by the way, is 80 or 90 years old. The other, I'm sure, over 100 years old. Um, and he said um, that there was absolutely no point whatsoever in trying to uh, renovate them. Uh, basically, the foundations are rotten and and uh, as fun and interesting a project as that might be, it would have been uh, a, a total uh, waste of, of time and money. Uh, so I chose at that time not to do anything with the place to allow me to continue to rent it or anything like that. It's now been sitting vacant for uh, 12 years, so it's even in uh, worse shape. I know some developers play that game, but I'm not a, a developer. I just uh, couldn't rent it in the condition that it was in. So. Uh, we need to uh, knock it down and build something uh, that will be uh, attractive looking in a hundred years for the next uh, time this issue comes up. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I believe I'm going to turn this over to our committee now. Uh, committee, questions, comments? I'm not seeing any. Oh, uh, Councillor Roberts and Councillor. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and through you to the to the applicant. Um, a beautiful little little piece of property, and I fully understand your why what you're going through and what you want to do. And I'm just wishing, I'm just thinking about just a proposal to um, maintain the the the, the, the heritage uh, or the history of this property if you would consider just taking photographs um, professionally done to uh, just show what these structures were like. And uh, just a proposal, it's not gonna weigh, uh, sway me either way, but I think it'd be a good way to uniquely capture some of the history when, you, when, when one structure is over a hundred years old and just, just sort of uh, something that maybe we can give to our heritage committee to sometime put in, in, in a book if they ever publish anything like that. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Uh, Councillor Kelly. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair Bridgman, and through you, and sorry, I don't have my uh, electronic hand to raise, unfortunately. Um, I know Ferry Island and I know Loon Island uh, quite well because it's just down the shore from uh, my place. In fact, it's a nice short sail to go down and circle Ferry Island and come back. Um, and as sad as I am always to see a heritage uh, place torn down, I can speak from personal experience and, and let you know that some of these cottages that are 80, 90, 100 years old were not built, were not built to stand up for 70 years. And uh, it's not actually just the cost of maintaining them. It's actually a, a full-time job to try to keep them up. So, um, but I will say uh, on, on behalf of the applicant that uh, if, uh, if the impact visual and otherwise is similar to what happened at Loon Island, uh, this is a nice addition to the neighborhood 
uh, the uh, the view on New Loon Island, it's almost hard to discern whether there's actually a structure on it. So um, I will be supporting this. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other comments? All right, seeing none, I'm going to read the resolution. I will comment that I'm delighted that only eight trees, I believe it was eight trees are coming down because it is a beautifully forested island and it's so nice to see that maintained. So, all right, I am going to read this. This is moved by Councillor Edwards, seconded by Councillor Kelly. Be it resolved the planning committee recommend to Township Council that ZBA-26-20 bylaw 2020-121 uh, live, live Group Investments Limited, roll number 4-24-0530, be approved. Any discussion? All in favor? Madam Clerk, that carries. Uh, yes. uh, opposed? Okay, one opposed. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so now we are going to go to our invited delegations and um, our delegation. And I believe if we can let Ms. Walton in, we have a number of people here in, in um, our Muskoka uh, Stakeholders Association. And I, I believe Jane is trying to let some of, some of you in. How, how's that going, Jane? So we can only have so many in. So I guess we'll, we'll Mar Margaret will come in. Okay. Are we ready? Uh, uh, yes, we are. Um, yes, we are, Ms. Walton. And um, is anybody else going to speak or are you doing all of the speaking? I am doing all of the speaking. Okay, we just needed to know who else we might have to let in. So please no. go, please go ahead. Thank you, and good morning. Good morning to the committee. Um, I'm Margaret Walton from Planscape. Can everyone hear me adequately? Perfect. All right, so I'm here this morning to introduce our Muskoka, a group comprised of business owners and residents who have been monitoring the official plan process. Members of the group who initiated our Muskoka and are on the line today include Chris Madden of Tamarack North, Jason Sift of Muskoka Lumber, Kevin Scott of Muskoka Landscaping, Carrie Kane of Casey Contracting, Mike Archambault representing the Muskoka Home Builders, Bob Clark, who's real estate and a developer, and Joe Quinn, who's also real estate. Barry Horosco, a lawyer with a planning a practice focused on planning law, is providing the group with legal support. Each member of this group had ongoing concerns about the official plan process as it evolved. The concerns were shared by many of their clients, their employees, and their neighbors. They felt it was important to come together with a united voice that represents business people, local residents, many of whom work for them, shoreline property owners and others. The purpose of the group is to ensure that all perspectives are represented through the process and that there's a balanced approach to managing development. Landscape was retained in October to provide them with input and advice on the planning process. I was I asked to advise them, given my experience working in and with the township for many years. I've been involved in past official plan processes. I was interested to hear when listening to the discussions online, the questions about why there are such complicated policies for the rural area. And I can tell you it was because the Ministry of Municipal Affairs was actively involved in those policies and they insisted they go in. So that's where that came from. Our group has been working together since late September, reviewing the work done to date. They are incorporated as our Muskoka. Their website is being launched today, explains who they are, why they formed, it gives people a chance to ask questions and provide feedback and support what we hope will be a positive and inclusive process. Some of the concerns the group has identified include, first, the removal of previously permitted development rights and increased limitation on, on properties that have previously and to date been grandfathered. This will impact the properties of many families who developed in compliance with the policies in place at the time. It will cause delay, expense, potential board hearings, and has the potential to create negativity amongst neighbors. Why? There is ongoing reference to the impact on water quality. Water quality is actually improving. 
you have already taken steps to ensure that improvement continues, including setting septic systems back, updating septic systems, and requiring significant shoreline buffers. The group believes that the rigid, increasingly rigid controls being introduced limit creative and innovative design and are resulting in the loss of historic structures. We need to find a better way of doing things. There is discussion about the implementation of a recreational carrying capacity model on some of the smaller lakes and perhaps bays on the big lakes. This is not an approach that I as a planner can support. It is an attempt to control behavior through the use of land use planning controls. It punishes those who are yet to develop for the sins of those who have already developed. The tendency seems to be to increasingly to continually increase regulation rather than putting the resources into the effective enforcement of existing regulation. All this is resulting in more of the same rather than looking to alternative approaches of which there are many in planning right now, we're at a very exciting point where there are lots of new techniques to use. Some of those that could be considered would be community permitting, which works with the characteristics of individual properties and would be extremely helpful in Muskoka and an alternative ownership model that will allow innovative family succession planning on residential lots to preserve the large properties rather than the ongoing severing that is increasingly leading to fragmentation of the shoreline. Conferring a development allowance with flexibility on how it's allocated instead of rigid controls that generate ongoing exemption applications and tend to result in a bit of cookie cutter development. I always felt the biggest mistake this township made was in allowing one sleeping cabin of 650 square feet. Look to the other municipalities where they're given an allowance of so many square feet and they can have small sleeping cabins, several. It would make for a much more, um, much more variety. Boat houses are the same. As those regulations have increased and increased and increased, we now have what we fondly refer to as the wedding cake boat houses because there's really one way to develop them. There's no creativity in the proposed direction that's being taken. It's just more of the same. At this time of COVID, when our practices are changing, this is an opportunity to be creative and productive in the change in the way, the way we do things. There seems to be a lack of trust in science and professional expertise. Too much focus on what ifs, vague references to reports that have been read that are not substantiated, rather than listening to staff and local experts. You have excellent staff and excellent experts who work for you. The cost and money and time of ever increasing regulation is driving away long-term residents. Muskoka is becoming increasingly exclusive and segregated and I think that is very sad. Too much focus um, in the official plan process seems to be on shoreline with a result lack of focus on local issues, attainable housing, year-round economy, healthy communities and alternative forms of development. We respect the efforts of our Muskoka to represent a select component of township residents, but they do not represent them all. We urge you to factor in the impact of COVID and the recovery from it. We're going to need to adjust to new norms. Working from home, the need for high-speed internet is vital. Long occupation, longer occupation of previously seasonal properties puts additional pressure on infrastructure. We need to focus on those issues. Finally, our Muskoka wants to ensure that all components of the population, permanent, seasonal, and transient, have input and are considered to ensure balance and diversity. We emphasize this group wants to work with the township and other stakeholders. We want to be positive and helpful. In the group is a lot of expertise and experience working in Muskoka. This is not about criticizing or judging. It is about working together to create a truly innovative and inclusive plan. After today, when we have introduced our Muskoka to Council, we will reach out to the other stakeholder groups and initiate discussions to share ideas. The website is being launched as we seek, and you can go to rmuskoka.ca to find out more about the group. I thank you very much for your time and attention. This is an exciting time and an opportunity to do things differently. Build on Muskoka as a world-class destination that is a leader in managing an environment you always have been. We want it to be an open place as we build a balanced and inclusive community. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Walton. One quick question before I open it up. On your website, some of the suggestions that you've made, will there be more detail on that so that people can understand some of the ideas and that you're talking about? 
Absolutely. We um, have done actually, we've gone through the directions document that the township prepared and, and responded to that. And um, we will be posting a questionnaire to get input from people. So the group is comfortable. They understand where people are coming from. And we will be working forward to provide ideas and thoughts as we hopefully can move forward together. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Councillor Zavitz. Thank you, and through you, Chairs. Uh, very interesting and certainly welcome uh, yet another special interest group uh, to our township, never a dull moment, and uh, certainly acknowledging, um, I, 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 and Margaret, if I might, sorry, through you, Chair, to, to uh, our speaker, um, your language, I mean, I, I pick up on, I'm very sensitive. Um, it seems to me that, that here we are, January, uh, the middle of January, and uh, the official plan is well on its way. Um, and you, you know, you're representing, you're speaking for a very influential group of uh, people that I certainly respect as, as business owners and certainly as residents, uh, community <laughs> neighbors, if you will, of mine. Um, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't know what the word is. Am I surprised to hear at this time, um, you know, cookie cutter boathouses, the, you know, the old birthday cake piece when it's the same companies that have been building them for all these years and have come to where they are today, very prosperous companies. Uh, these are millions and millions of dollars. Uh, so, you know, I, I do believe that we need to work together. And I certainly I welcome this group. Uh, you know, we can look in the website, we can do all the things as we might for the MLA, Friends of Muskoka, MRA, others. Uh, so I welcome the group. Um, I just hope there's a little bit more clarity to what your intention is. If you're, you did a lot of we, you said we, we, you actually. So you're talking to, to we, the council, uh, the township, you're actually directing us to let our staff have more uh, input and direction, use their expertise more. I would love you to chat to us about that because I, I'm not aware that we aren't. Thank you. Ms. Walton, would you like to respond to that? Well, I think first of all, um, I think there was an implication that this group hasn't been involved in the official plan process. They have been, they've been monitoring it as it moved forward. And uh, frankly, um, the direction paper that came out in October was really the first time council spoke as a, as a group. And so we now have on the table, you know, what council, and, and I understand this is all proposed and hasn't been approved yet, but I think it sort of, it forms a context for discussion. And, um, you know, the group that I'm representing is, I wouldn't call it a special interest group. I think the intent is that it will represent a broad base of, of people. And so um, I welcome uh, Councilor Zabit's um, opportunity to speak. And I think we can, we can work through these issues and have some interesting discussions, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Jaglowitz. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, through you to, uh, to the delegate, uh, Margaret. Um, you and I have been on opposite sides of issues in the past, but I applaud you for coming here today. And I, I think that uh, I, I personally welcome the input from yourself and your group. And I think as councillors, we have to listen to all views uh, when we uh, look at these important matters. And so I applaud you and I encourage you. And, and I have nothing negative to say about your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jacobus. We're often on the we have been on opposite sides, but we've also been on the same side. So I think we both have the same interest at heart is really what's best for Muskoka Lakes. Yeah, Councillor Roberts. Thank you and through you, Madam Chair. Yes, I, I'm encouraged with this uh, special interest group coming forward. I do call it a special interest group for my own definition, but um, this was what we were trying to get through the whole process with the public meetings and that. And so now it is not, uh, as you know, it's not too late, um, but we have been telling all groups, all individuals that the first draft, the official plan that will be on the table published, um, I'm led to believe in February, will give everyone's first opportunity to really look to see what, what came out of the policy directions because the policy directions weren't all inclusive. They were snapshots of changes. So the, the first draft of the official plan is everyone's opportunity to go in and find those pieces or that are, are, are limiting um, grant, uh, because of grandfather rules or something like that, and then work with the township and, and the, um, 
official plan committee to um, tweak it. And, uh, and we, I look forward to those conversations. This is fantastic. Thank you. You're welcome. And I would like to make the point too that right now, most of the members of our group work full time and summer is an incredibly busy time for them. So I know this township has always worked really hard to balance off the time they do their consultations, but do bear in mind that doing focusing in the summer season makes it difficult for those who work full time and, and make their living here. So um, hopefully if it comes out in February, our group's a little less busy this time of year. And so therefore they will have the time to spend on this. So thank you very much. Okay, so I don't see any other hands for comments, but I would like to also thank you. And I think I echo the comments that you've heard and I won't call you a special interest group. It is another group of our, our residents. And, and I particularly um, appreciate the thoughts on the attainable housing and the off water um, comments, because that is one area that I would be, I would also really be looking forward to what your, what your suggestions are on that. And I see Councillor Mazan now has her hand up. Sorry, thank you and through you, Madam Chair. Um, two quick comments. First of all, I was also thrilled to hear um, the thinking around future, future that we, we do have some serious challenges with climate change and the pandemic as two things I think you noted in your comments and just some innovative creative ways for us to, um, to lead in this area. So uh, you also touched upon broadband, that's obviously critical, it's a timely piece. So. Um, I have had a few people asking me now, they can't find your website. So if, if I could just ask that you repeat what your website is. It's rmuskoka.ca. It should be okay. up, it was supposed to go up at nine o'clock. So unless, if there's a problem, I'll, I'll check it as soon as I get off. And I would I would like to thank you. And, and you know, Muskoka has got a reputation for doing really creative, innovative things. I mean, we started the whole water quality modeling thing and, and you know, and I think there are some really interesting developments in planning, responding to climate change, to, you know, change in work patterns, all those types of things. And so I think that this township has a great opportunity to set some new standards. So I look forward to the discussion and you've got good consultants and I look forward to discussions with them. So hopefully we can, we can make a really positive difference. Okay, well, thank you, Ms. Walton and your group. Um, that's really uh, encouraging to hear and we look forward to working with you uh, in the future. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so now we are going to move to six. Um, this is the report from our direct, director of DSES on the Leonard Lake Lake Plan. So, would and, is, and I'm Mark Mark Scarrow is here. Would you like him to speak first, David? I can briefly. Okay. Let, let's, let, um, let's let our director introduce it and then Mr. Scarrow, you may speak. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, committee. Uh, just very quickly, uh, I think uh, most committee members will recall in December, we did discuss uh, three lake plans that were submitted to the municipality. Uh, shortly thereafter, we did receive uh, the finalized lake plan from uh, the Leonard Lake Stakeholders Association and staff uh, tried to get that in front of committee quickly so we can try to send that to the consulting team uh, if committee is supportive as they were in December. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Mr. Scarrow is here, I believe the president of that association to uh, I can screen share and uh, have his presentation ready and staff uh, did prepare a brief report and happy to answer any questions on that uh, upon conclusion of the presentation. Okay, Mr. Scarrow, are you ready to go there and we're screen sharing with him, are we? Yeah, yes, I'm ready to go oh. and I think. I, I see Dir Director, yeah, Director Pink is, is screen sharing. So please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of council and committee and members of staff. My name is Mark Scarrow. I'm residing at 1250 Leonard Lake Road 2 which is Milford Bay, P1L1X4. Um, I think you know a little bit about our lake and the process that we've been through. We're just halfway between Port Carling and, uh, and Bracebridge along Highway 118. And without further ado, um, I'll set my timer and we should 
carry on with the next slide, please. So a tiny little bit about the lake. We are a small lake, we're a headwater lake. There's about 160 property owners on the lake, mostly developed in the 60s and 70s. We have quite a few small lots um, on the lake that were developed back in that uh, time frame. And there's two large stretches of undeveloped lakefront, uh, one of which was granted severance um, more recently. Um, we have had some water quality challenges in recent years, uh, two public notices regarding blue-green uh, algae and one this spring with a golden brown lake white algae bloom. So we do have some water quality challenges. We have a shallow basin portion of the lake, <clears throat> fairly low flush rate through the lake. And we have some lake bottom anoxia, which means there's no oxygen at the bottom of the lake, which presents other special challenges. Uh, also the lake is experiencing what many other lakes are experiencing, which would be a bit more uh, emphasis on permanent residence and more heavy use, uh, longer seasonal use, et cetera. The lake does have a long history of being involved in all kinds of uh, water quality programs and so on and so forth. The, um, yep, next slide is fine, thank you. The lake plan process does date back quite a long, uh, a long time. We originally had a lake plan done in the 2006, 2008 period, uh, served us very well. Uh, at our lake association AGM back in 2018, there was a call for a renewal of the lake plan. And we certainly did receive encouragement on this process from both the district and the township. Um, so with all of that, we decided to launch on a renewal process. Um, what we did is start with a new survey, uh, modeling many of the questions that were on the old survey and also branching into some new areas that were more uh, contemporary, I guess. Um, the process really was to reach out beyond our, our membership group. Um, to make sure every stakeholder on the group, whether they're waterfront, backlot, a member of the association or not, uh, would be included. So um, <clears throat> that's what we did. And we got quite a good response on the survey. And really then the lake plan content and policies are based on the results uh, with particular emphasis for the results that we got back from actual property owners. Um, the summary and all of the data were published at that website, which is our Lake Association website. Uh, next slide. This slide very quickly shows you some of the summary of results from the lake plan. On the right side, what detracts from the enjoyment of the lake? These are the issues that were, were brought forward, development, you know, light pollution, noise, all the things you might expect. Um, so this is a very summarized snapshot of what the um, what the survey showed us. Uh, next slide. The suggestions that were given in the free format part of the survey were clustered into sort of three nodes. One was development, where we had many suggestions. The other was water quality and septic systems. Um, there were some other uh, uh, responses and suggestions uh, up around uh, boat wakes and shoreline vulnerability and, and such like that. But these three areas were the main areas, development, water quality, and septics. And next slide. So the consultation process, we published the draft late plan. Uh, we sent e-blast to all stakeholders, inviting participation, comment, and feedback. We had six Zoom calls and one telephone conference call that were held. We had uh, many one-on-one -on -one email discussions and that was offered to all stakeholders. Uh, about halfway through the process, we were still struggling really to get good participation. I sent a personalized email to every single landowner who had not otherwise signed up for a Zoom call. Um, we adjusted the policies as we got some stakeholder feedback. And in the end, uh, and the numbers are still shifting around a little bit, but we believe we have just more than 50% of the landowners participating. Um, and 93% of those who did participate voted in favor. We had Zoom calls with the online uh, confidential poll or people were able to email into us. Next slide. The lake plan policies, um, they, uh, these are the main items, which uh, were also in the staff report um, that Mr. Pink uh, put forward. And maybe we can flip to the next slide because I'm running low on time. As two examples, uh, we do think recreational carrying capacity makes sense for our lake. Uh, the study showed that we're about 100% over capacity based on that model already. Um, we think it works well in a small to medium sized lake. 
And then the lot coverage and limiting overall dwelling size to 3,500 square feet from the 7,500 square feet current policy. Um, <clears throat> we thought that this was, uh, was reasonable. Many of the small lots will in fact run into the 8% limitation before they would actually run into the 3,500 square foot limitation. And the 3,500 square feet is also the dwelling size that was agreed by the North Shore developer uh, in the LPAT settlement with the town. So <clears throat> it seems a reasonable figure. Um, and that was the rationale behind that particular policy. So some of these late plan policies simply mirror what's in the township and some of them go a little further. Um, so there's a mixture of that. And I'm over my time limit. So the next slide just shows very quickly what some of our late plan actions that we're going to uh, be involved with going forward. Um, this is really just information for you. And with Mr. that, the, excuse me, Mr. Scarrow, yeah. please, please give us what you feel is important. I know you're running a little bit over, but you've done a tremendous amount of work here and, and this is important. So um, don't, feel, don't feel that you have to cut out some things that you really want to say. Okay, um, that's pretty much it. I mean, if you wanted to go back to the Lake Plan Policy slide, um, it is, it is summarized in, in David's report. Um, really RCC and no, no new lot creation. We don't think the, the lake can really take any additional um, dwellings. Um, on the development and redevelopment policies, there's, there's the dwelling size. We would, uh, we would prefer no new boathouses on the lake. There are three or four or five boathouses on the lake currently. The character of the lake doesn't really fit with boat houses. It's a small lake. Um, character of the lake is good coverage of uh, forest all the way around the lake. So as you look out on the lake, you don't see boat houses. Um, we like the strong setbacks uh, for tree preservation and redevelopment. Um, wastewater treatment's an area that we had a ton of feedback from, from our uh, stakeholders. And there was some minor disappointment that it seems the township um, is unable to mandate tertiary water treatment systems. Um, so that's something that we'd like to work with the township on. Uh, we understand that Innisfil has a mandatory every five year inspection by private contractors that are licensed and, and at a nominal cost, I think of $130. So I think there's some very strong sentiment around the lake to buy into a much sort of stronger wastewater treatment protocol. And really commercial use is another one. Way back in the day, the lake did have a, a gas bar. Uh, that would be stretched to call it a marina, but it was, you could go and buy gas. Um, that's been gone for a long time. And there's a general consensus that the lake doesn't really have the capacity to take on any commercial use. Um, and the construction mitigation measures, I think possibly some of the things we have in our lake plan are maybe slated to be in your new official plan. So we could be, uh, that could be um, something that we'll we'll understand better when we see the first draft. So that that's really that's really it. I am conscious of the time, so I'll I'll uh, close it up right there. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Scarrow, and I believe I'm going to turn it to committee now. Any comments? Any thoughts? It was a very. I mean, the, the lake plan is very comprehensive. It looks great. And it looks to me, oh, is Councillor Mazan, I think you're, are you waving your hand? Okay, <laughs> Councillor Mazan. I didn't realize I had my hand uh, back, the gold hand. Um, first of all, and thank you and through you, uh, Chair Bridgman. Uh, first of all, thank you, Mr. Scarrow for a very comprehensive uh, lake plan. I think it's a hundred some odd page, <laughs> it's, it's a long one. Uh, but that's an indicative of a lot of work that you guys have put into um, and the care that you have for your lake. Uh, a question I have, maybe more directed towards our staff. Um, now that we have some of these, more uh, of these plans coming forward and ensuring that they have relevance if we, if we move to the official plan process, how do we ensure that the public consultation has been done at the standard that uh, makes, makes these things relevant? 
for all of the work that they've gone through, you know, when it comes to a hard decision, you know, at what, how do we prioritize something that's important to the township versus something that's important to the Lake Association and um, ensure that public has been given their due course? I guess it's consistency I'm looking for. Um, I'm going to ask if you could maybe state that again, Councillor Mazan. I'm I'm unclear what you're asking. Okay, I think I, I think what I'm I'm seeing we it, it, the lake plans happen to have happened in Ward B, but I just want to be sure that there's a consistency in public consultation. And I know that noted in the staff report that um, they did talk about public consultation again. And I just, you know, each of these independent lake associations have done their own public con consultation, but I'm asking as a township, do we need to, to make sure that the policies that are being recommended or the considerations are at a standard that uh, is, is defendable? Um, I guess I'm asking for the opinion from Director Pink on public consultation. Is that something that we need to be there? And um, would this be like at LPAT? Is that one of the extensions of this, Councillor Mazan? Well, I think that's what I'm asking Director Pink. Yeah. Is do we okay. need to be? Yeah, okay. I just wanted to clarify that for me. Okay. Okay, Director sorry. Pink. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll try my best to answer that. I think, I think committee probably notes in all the lake plans you've seen so far that there's a really strong uh, encouragement of consultation and I, I think uh, that's probably emanating from my comments to them uh, assisting all the lake associations throughout the process to really uh, not only uh, go above and beyond in that consultation but then document that and certainly I wouldn't say there's consistency you, you can see different strategies different approaches within each but I think uh, by and large the amount of uh, feedback that each association did get uh, is pretty substantial, uh, quite a bit more than we typically would get on an official plan exercise. Um, it's always difficult to engage the public at this high level planning stage until something directly impacts them. Um, but at, at the end of the day, as, as noted in the report, there are pros and cons to um, you know, rolling in a comprehensive change like this as part of a broader project. It, it sometimes can get missed. Um, or as, as we've seen, a lot of the discussion can concentrate on a few hot button items to the detriment of some other discussions that may occur. Um, however, I think uh, I can comfortably say, I think as noted in the report, I commend the lakes, uh, the lake associations for the amount of outreach they did. They've got, uh, like I say, quite a bit of feedback. I would never expect 100% support uh, from uh, any large group, but I think we're getting pretty close. Uh, but at the end of the day, I would say it's ultimately up to committee and council whether you feel, you know, these need to be separated, uh, separate uh, later projects down the road, uh, or whether the municipality, again, uh, this summer, will do our best uh, to continue to get the word out on this pro uh, project. And we hope to get uh, more and more comments as part of the official plan uh, process, including on these lake plans. And we'll just do our best through email blasts, social media, uh, and what other outreach we can do in, a, in this pandemic world. Uh, to try to get the public engaged and aware that these changes are occurring uh, on these lakes. Uh, but ultimately, again, it, it would be a council decision whether you feel uh, that's sufficient or not. I think staff's uh, generally comfortable with what we've seen with these uh, lake associations. They've, they've really documented it well and, and have done quite a bit of outreach. Hopefully that, that helps. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Edwards. Uh, yes, well, thank you very much. Uh, excellent presentation, Mark. Uh, it was really good. And, you know, I've learned over the years that all these smaller lakes, uh, the ones that aren't the, the what they, we normally call the big three, each are unique in their own uh, uh, settings and everything else like that. They all and that. So I'm really pleased that they, the association would take the time to do the lake plan. It helps us with our uh, planning and that listening to what everyone says uh, and that I, I, I would uh, support this lake plan as well as the other ones. Um, there may be some, some, some challenges obviously to it, but I think it's a start. And if you get the 50 or 60 percent, whatever it was that uh, that go along with it, it goes a long way to, to, to solving the uh, problems that we have on the small lakes. So thank you for all your effort and input. 
Okay. All right. I don't see any other hands up at this point, so I am going to read the resolution. Moved by Councillor Jaglowitz, seconded by Councillor Hayes, be it resolved the planning committee recommend to Township Council that the Leonard Lake plan be forwarded to the Township's official plan review consulting team for consideration and inclusion in the draft official plan as part of phase four of the official plan review. Any comments? All in favor? That is unanimous. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Scarrow. All right, we're now going to move to the Manette official plan amendment update. So I am going to ask our director, this is verbal, I'm going to ask our, our director, Mr. Pink, if he would please give us the after district council discussion from December and where, where we're going from here. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. Um, just, I believe we did have a brief discussion at the December planning committee meeting uh, and just to provide a, a brief update. Uh, since then, the District of Muskoka Council uh, did not change uh, or make any changes to the um, decision of the District Engineering and Public Works and Planning Committee uh, meeting, uh, which was essentially not to support residential uses on in Minette on uh, private communal services. Um, so to provide a, a bit of background on our process, as a committee is generally aware, uh, we have, uh, council has um, endorsed a draft official plan amendment for Minette and endorsed it in the sense of uh, releasing it for public consultation. Um, and we were in the midst uh, of doing so and uh, waiting for the district to uh, to move along with us. Uh, so the what I would just highlight, what has changed essentially is the district has concern with one aspect of the draft official plan that they've identified uh, to date, that being the uh, private communal servicing and residential uses. I did have the opportunity uh, to speak uh, with the principal stakeholder, uh, Mitch Goldhar's uh, planning consultant, uh, just very recently this week uh, on the changes that have occurred as a result of the district direction. Uh, they were to uh, forward me um, a brief memo outlining their uh, their principal concerns. I did just receive that actually during this meeting, so I will touch on that very briefly, but I did get the email uh, in the midst of this meeting. What I can characterize our, our conversation as, um, what uh, they feel very strongly is they, um, the principal stakeholder is generally supportive of, munis of installing municipal services in Minette, uh, but that is contingent on acceptance uh, by district council and, and township council of certain changes to the draft official plan amendment. And in our discussion uh, earlier this week, I would highlight uh, two principal uh, areas that I uh, recognize in our discussion as, as the main areas of concern. Uh, one, uh, you may recall in the draft official plan amendment, a uh, limit on residential uses to 25%. Uh, they would uh, request or appreciate a, that increase to 35%. There was also a limit in the draft official plan policies that limits uh, the amount of all uses, uh, GFA to 750,000 square feet uh, in the village core area. And there is a policy that would not permit units to exceed 50% of that amount. Uh, in their opinion, what that essentially does is half the unit count uh, that they agreed to. So just in very rough general ballpark numbers, current official plan policies permit, we'll call it approximately 4,000 units in Minette. Throughout the steering committee and uh, working group negotiations, the principal stakeholder did agree to reduce that amount to, we'll say approximately 2,000 units. They feel this policy would in essence then have that to approximately 300. Uh, units in the village core area down from 882 and that's a that's a concern to them. Those were the two main concerns. Um, in the email I just received uh, this morning in the brief memo, uh, they have highlighted uh, other areas uh, of concern with respect to docking uh, and the restrictions on dock usage, uh, concerns about definitions on traveling and vacationing public and unit owners, um, the appendix that outlines owner use provisions, 
uh, with respect to uh, the use of units, uh, if they were to be condominiumized, and modifications and alterations to uh, existing structures. Uh, they wish to, I think, uh, retain some flexibility um, during modifications, alterations, and redevelopment uh, to retain existing building footprints and uh, similar type of issues. So those are the comments I can uh, pass along uh, from our discussions since um, since the latest uh, information was received from the district. Uh, staff is uh, you know, looking for direction from committee as to how you wish to move forward. Uh, we can certainly uh, work on making changes to the draft official plan amendment with respect to servicing and bring that forward directly to the council meeting in February for Council's uh, direction on circulating that for public consumption. Happy to answer any questions. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. So I believe um, just to, just to, okay, I see that. Uh, just before I go to you, Councillor Jaglowitz, just to, to clarify that, uh, Mr. Pink, you will bring this back to Council in February. Uh, the suggestion is to bring it back to Council in February with the change to its municipal servicing in the official plan. Just to sort of, do you want to speak to that again? Sure. sure. Yeah, I mean, certainly, I, I suggest in the interest of time, obviously this process has been dragging on uh, for a few years now. Uh, to expedite the process, I'm happy to bring um, you know, any further information back directly to council in February, but I look for direction from committee as to, as to your wishes, but staff can certainly make changes to the draft official plan amendment that uh, council previously endorsed uh, with respect to the change to servicing. And I can bring that back directly uh, to council in February. Okay, and just, um, I, I guess my thought would be before I get to Councillor Jaglowitz that we could then circulate it to the public and certainly the principal stakeholder can address all of those concerns that they they have said to us. So we can still get it out to the public and there they'll have their forum for that. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. Councillor Jaglowitz, goodbye. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. Unfortunately, I'm getting an emergency alert on my phone. I just want to get it away from here. Uh, it's uh, the emergency alert is uh, stay home, everyone. I know. The Unfortunately, it's just going to go off and I can't stop it. So I put it in another yep. room. <laughs> um, thank you, Chair, for, for allowing me to address this. This was a surprise to me. I didn't see it on the agenda and I, that may have been my, my error. Uh, so, so that's why I put my hand up. Um, I think Director Pink, you have um, through you, Chair, to Director Pink. I think you're asking for some input. I think that's what I hear, hear you, so that you can come back with something. And um, I'll, I'll give you my input. Um, uh, I have no trouble with this uh, commercial development going forward on private services. And I don't believe the district does either. If it's a commercial development without a residential component, okay? And um, I was prepared to amend what the district did or to, or to ask the district to amend it to that effect. Unfortunately, what happened was when it came forward to the district, it came forward with uh, private services and residential together. There, were no, there was no option for one or the other. So my strong preference is for this to be a commercial development and I see no problem with private services and I believe the district would endorse that. Now I'm speaking for myself now, I'm not speaking for any other member at the district. Uh, it would appear to me that the developer has rejected that from what you've said and that what he wants now is municipal services and he wants a residential development there. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, a, a mixed use, a mixed use. In other words, he wants to increase the amount of residential that's available. And I think that's the wrong way to go. So I don't know what type of support I'll have on this council for this position, but I'm, I'm very initially opposed 
to changing our position to allowing residential development on public services. So I, I, I give you that as my comment. I may change it as I think more through. And, and I would appreciate if there's any other members on council that feel the same. M Manette has always been a resort area. And I, I encourage the redevelopment of this project. I think it's good to have uh, that de this development go forward, but it should not go forward as a residential development on the waterfront. The residential component should be in our serviced areas of Port Carling and Bala. We should not be creating a third one. And I feel very strongly on that. So I, I, I have expressed that and I ask maybe other councillors that might want to chime in. Thank you. Okay, if I could just, uh, before I get to the other councillors, a clarification, um, Director Pink, I believe what we submitted contained um, residential development in the commercial area that the that went to the district did contain that because I'm hearing Councillor Jaglowitz say that wasn't our position. So could you please clarify that? Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, uh, the Chair's understanding is correct. The draft OPA that was endorsed for public consultation did include uh, residential uses uh, permitted up to 25% of the residential uses. What I would also could confirm if we want to step back uh, under the existing uh, permissions of uh, Manette, uh, currently uh, the policies would allow as of today 50% uh, residential uses throughout Manette. Uh, the draft OPA did reduce that to, to 25%. Uh, certainly uh, in response to Councillor Jagowitz's comments, another option uh, rather than move to municipal services is to retain private communal services. Uh, but uh, the district was clear they would not support any residential uses on that. I can relay the message again uh, from the principal stakeholder uh, in their email they just sent me today that uh, supplementing resort commercial uses with residential uses is not only of fundamental importance to achieving the vision of the redevelopment of the property, it's necessary when considering the, soft, the costs associated uh, with introducing it. So um, I think the developer or the principal stakeholder has been very clear uh, that residential uses are of utmost importance uh, for their redevelopment of the property. Um, but I would note, uh, uh, again, um, Chair's understanding is, uh, is correct. The draft OPA did have 25%. I would also point out that uh, the draft OPA had other um, conditions on that 25%. Uh, it wasn't straight up residential. I would concur with Councillor Jagowitz. It is a resort community. That's clear in the vision and the growth strategy for Manette that it is principally a resort community. And the proposed draft policies uh, would require that uh, resort related residential uses be allowed. So still integrated as part of the resort, but not in a mandatory rental pool. And the other key distinction that I think uh, was certainly a beneficial compared to the current policies was that those residential uses, if permitted, would be in later phases of the development. Uh, the current policies would allow again 50% residential uh, with uh, that permission available at the onset of development. Uh, the draft official plan that was approved for consultation uh, would have required that those residential uses only occur once the commercial uses are established uh, and again, that they would be resort related. So hopefully that helps provide some background. Supplementary, supplementary, please. Thank you. Uh, yes, for sure. Go ahead. Uh, 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 thank you. Um, in response to that, uh, um, through you, Chair, uh, this, this council, in my view, at the, when they put this draft out for public consultation, I don't believe addressed the issue of private or public services. The wording of that was public or private. I don't think we took a position. Now, I, I could be wrong on that. We, we threw it out to the public to see how it would land and then uh, agreed for, for it to come back. The problem with residential on private services, we all know, is, is that's very problematic. So, so I now understand that the, um, that the proponent has, has gone to public services. But the, the, I believe that the steering committee 
was very clear that any residential should not be on the waterfront and should be back from the waterfront. And they were, they were not saying there cannot be residential. It just shouldn't be in, in the commercial area. It should be back. It can be on individual services in some other way. And, and I know that I may not have a lot of support for this, but I, I, I guess um, um, how do we keep this a commercial development? That, that's, that's the struggle here. And as you know, we have um, lost that fight in the other resorts. And, um, and that's sad in my mind. So I, I, I just, I would hope there'd be some opportunity for us to have another discussion on this. And, and if it is at the next meeting, that's okay. But, but David, I, I prefer if you came back to us with some options rather than possibly giving in to what they're asking for. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And I'll, I'll leave it there because I, I, you've, you've heard my position. And uh, I think uh, one thing I've learned being on this council, and I think the mayor taught me this. He, uh, do you, as you recall early in my, in my tenure here, I walked out of one meeting because I didn't like the way it was going. And that was wrong of me. And I should not have done that. The mayor pointed out to me that if I disagree with something, I should state my disagreement. Okay, and we're a group, and if the group decides one thing, then I'll, I'll accept that. But I just want you to be aware of my, of, of my position. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Jaglowitz. And just before I go on, I mean, if, if, if we send this out with the current wording, we're still going to get feedback from the public. So nothing's written in stone at this point. I just want to make sure everybody understands that in, in also people who are listening in and councillors, and I do see you Councillor Kelly, but Councillor Zavitz is next. I'm happy for this to go out as it is, if that's what you're, if you're saying chair, yes. Thank you, thank you chair through you. Uh, and not to get off that topic, a very heavy duty one. And of course we need to contemplate uh, that, you know, Councillor Jagowitz and I agree. Um, I'm asking, I'm seeking information on the municipal services piece. Uh, who, who pays for all this? What, what does it mean? Uh, and I guess through you, David, or to you, David, um, what does it mean to us as a township? What does it mean to our budget? Do, are we now, because it's municipal and it somehow gets through, the district says, okay, we all say, uh, you know, what, what does that look like for the township of Muskoka Lake from a cost perspective? Thank you. Okay, director, sorry on here go ahead thank you chair uh, <laughs> the uh, the intention and the vision for this development since its onset in the early 2000s has always been that the developer would pay for those services uh, we would ensure uh, that would occur i just wanted to clarify uh, or just comment on one quick point uh, before it's forgotten on um, councillor jaglowitz question i think the sort of implied as if um I'm bringing forward, um, you know, this to, to give in to the developers' uh, requests. Uh, I think you appropriately noted what I've seen. One of the major concerns uh, of council through this term has been, uh, as you put it, lost um, some battles to ensure commercial use. Um, I think the I have to commend uh, the principal stakeholders through this process. They have agreed to some significant compromises on uh, unit numbers, and also on the restrictions on use. If you recall, previous LPAT decisions was as little as uh, two weeks in a rental pool over the summer months as part of this draft OPA. And I believe that the principal stakeholder is in agreement with that uh, would be that uh, the use by the unit owner would only be a maximum of four weeks over the summer. And I think that's a significant improvement. And I'd rather see discussions go and continue to work uh, collaboratively uh, with the developer in the group. Uh, and they've indicated very strongly that uh, residential uses are a, a key component of this. So I'd rather continue those discussions rather than, um, again, uh, live with the policies that are currently in place, which I think council certainly has had concerns with. So I just wanted to, uh, uh, to point that out. Okay, thank you. Mayor Harding? Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, and I guess from a strategic perspective, as we move this forward, we had a Manette steering committee 
that worked out some draft OPA that council vetted and said, yes, we would put this forward. Um, I know when that went to council, there was some confusion with the developer um, and uh, some of the translation I say as the actual draft OPA got written in stone. And one of those I think was the 25% commercial usage. Um, I, I remember, and again, a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the developer uh, was a set at 35%. So uh, I think there was some confusion on a half of a half or three quarters of a half or whatever the numbers are. Um, I haven't seen any of the changes proposed, but I, I'm going to suggest we put something forward um, that was on a private services based on our development standards and what we wanted at that point. Again, I think the developer had some questions about that. I'll, I'll park that for a second, but it's now on municipal. So I, I think what we really need to do is probably hold just a very quick meeting at one point and happy to call a special meeting or yourself, Madam Chair, uh, with our committee first to really have just a little bit more of a fulsome uh, discussion with the developer. Um, Councillor Jagwood's perspective that, you know, and I appreciate that we don't recommend having any residential development. Uh, the property rights currently have 50% residential development in the waterfront area at 4,000 units. So um, I appreciate that we may want something different. The individual in the room being that of the developer, I think we really need to understand and try and find agreement. Because if we push this forward with something that they disagree with, regardless of what I'm gonna say, we're gonna send up an LPAT and it's going to be out of our hands. We always knew that going in, the more we could work with them to find something, and maybe we can't find common ground, but I really wanna understand personally, their interpretation, their perspective, uh, if they've made changes to the OPA as David has suggested, which I don't doubt they have, but why are those changes there? And I wanna have that dialogue before it's pushed out to the public so that I understand that, um, so that we don't end up in an LPAT hearing. I think an additional meeting is the smart way to go, at which point then it can come to council and we can move forward. So that is my recommendation, Madam Chair, as we move forward. Okay, thank you, Mayor Harding. So perhaps what we will do then is uh, try and set up a meeting before our next council meeting uh, so it can go directly to council. And um, I can leave that with Mr. Pink because obviously we need the schedule of the, of the developer. So if that, um, I've got two people before I say anything more. Um, Councillor Kelly. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just uh, I, my comment, which may have been uh, um, alleviated by uh, by the mayor's comments, was that I, I frankly have lost track of what the ask is today. Uh, we, I, 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 I must be off to a slow start. I don't see it anywhere on the agenda. I did hear a letter being read, but quite frankly, I think we we do need to uh, have more time, more information, and an opportunity to talk uh, either with or without the de developer before we start giving anybody any direction. That's it. Okay, well, that, that folds into another meeting for sure. Uh, Councillor Edwards? Uh, yes, uh, and that's the chair. Uh, I agree with uh, the, the mayor on this. We should have a, a, another meeting. And um, I can see and that's some of the council's uh, and that frustration with this has been going on for years. But um, um, if, if, if I guess if everybody's a little bit unhappy, it's a good settlement. And I wouldn't like to see it go up to 50%. I would like to see residential not on the waterfront. It should be uh, at, at the uh, back and that. And I had mentioned before, if you're gonna go on the waterfront, it should be a 200 foot lot, it's the same as, uh, our uh, other uh, residential areas. And uh, I think we've given too much up over the years. Uh, the uh, district with their 50 50 has is, is really hurt us. And that, and if we can get it down to uh, the 35%, uh, that would be fine. Uh, I did support uh, the other um, because they, they could put um, all the uh, commercial on a uh, private system. And then the residential could be on individual systems at the uh, back. So there's some something there, but I think we should have another meeting and I would support that. Thank you. Okay, we're going to get you to repeat all that at the next meeting, 
Councillor Edwards, <laughs> so we don't lose it. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, Mr. Pink, we will work on that. Thank. Do you want to speak? Just to just to confirm, the the direction is to schedule a special planning committee meeting between now and February's council, hopefully sooner, uh, and request the principal stakeholder to delegate at that meeting with their comments on uh, as a result of the changes from the district of Muskoka. Is that the general direction? Everybody, just uh, either a hand or a nod. Barb, if I may, just a quick question, just clarification. I don't think it's a special planning committee meeting right now. I, 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 well, yes, please, Mayor Harding, go sorry, ahead. Thank you. Um, I, I wasn't recommending a special planning committee meeting because in the Manette working group meeting, we had some other community stakeholders involved. Um, and that was my recommendation to go back to that working group, who's the one who recommended that to council or planning committee. I think it could go to that group and then come straight to council in February. Um, but I'd, I'd really like to have the interests in that working group of those people on the Manette Steering Committee, I think is appropriate. Okay, so I can, I can see that, but then I'm going to ask Councillor Kelly, who said he really wants more time, if if being discussed at council next time uh, sort of satisfies you. If, if we get a report in, uh, in, you know, an adequate time in advance of the meeting, sure. I'm comfortable with that. All right, so now uh, does that, uh, Councillor Edwards? Uh, yes, and that's with the chair. I, I had heard what the mayor had asked for and I, I totally agree with that. Uh, get the, the parties and that together and then bring something back to uh, council. Thank you. Councillor Jagowitz. Yes, I, I don't disagree with that, but I, I think coming directly to council might be a problem. Um, I, I think it's good to get the group together because you can have better uh, uh, discussions in that private group, which is not public. But I still think it has to come forward to this group for a wholesome discussion, as uh, as Councillor Kelly stated. So if you bring it direct to council, don't expect it to be decided there. It may have to, it should be debated, not just voted on. Uh, that's my view. This is, this is, after all, this is our decision. That's what we get the big bucks for, okay? That smaller group, that, that's effective, and, and I think it's good, but we shouldn't just rubber stamp what they come back with. That, that's my point. So, so, so uh, with that, I have no issue. It would be better if it had come back to planning and then gone to council. But of course, our meetings are out of, out of order. So uh, uh, maybe, maybe it'll have to come to a special planning uh, ahead of council. Anyway, I'll, I'll leave that in your capable hands. As I said before, I'm one of 10 and, and I'll, I'll go along with what the majority decides. So I believe Director Pink would like to speak again. Just apologize if, if this throws a bit of a wrench in the in the direction, but I would just want to point out that the, I think it was at the December, uh, or sorry, at the uh, council meeting where the draft OPA was approved for circulation, that part of that resolution by council specifically disbanded, concluded the working group. So as much as it was, um, important and, and helpful to move this process along. They, they are officially concluded. Uh, we can try to convene a, a group of people and I can try to do that if that is the direction of committee. But I would point out, uh, and I think uh, further to Councillor Jaglowitz's comments, at the, at the end of the day, a difficult decision has to be made because I can say being part of those steering committee and working group meetings for several years, the issue with servicing and residential uses or not is a very, key and difficult uh, not to crack that uh, the two sides, when I would say the uh, members of the steering committee and the principal stakeholder, I wouldn't say particularly see eye to eye uh, on that. And I, I question if one uh, meeting in the next week or two, uh, that major issue will be resolved. Um, so I can come uh, confidently back to this group in two weeks time that uh, they've come to an agreement. I, I question whether that's really gonna be possible. I think ultimately council will have to make a decision whether you wish to see um, again, 
uh, municipal services that do allow some residential component uh, or private communal services with no residential component. Um, we've heard loud and clear from the principal stakeholder which, which they prefer. So Mr. Pink, I, I think one of the one of the things we need is complete clarity on where the principal stakeholder will now be sitting with with commercial services. So I think that's something that we all need to understand. Um, so so Mayor Harding, um, thank you. I think I heard from Mr. Pink, and just to, to clarify, though our Minette Steering Committee has officially disbanded. Um, we can call kind of, I believe, an ad hoc group of people, which would include those same people, just for a little bit of a discussion. Um, uh, nothing official or whatever, but I think that that initial discussion in a smaller group of people is extremely worthwhile to hear from some of the community stakeholders, first of all. And then if it comes back to a planning committee in February or council in February, I agree with Councillor uh, Jagowitz that this group of people ultimately need to dis discuss and finalize those specific recommendations. But I know myself, um, you know, based on what I've heard from Mr. Pink, there needs to be some clarification in a smaller group of people exactly why the developers make changes to that draft OPA. Um, and I'd really like to understand that. Okay, so I believe the direction would be ad hoc group of people that look a lot like the working group. <laughs> And then we will go on from uh, from there. And I think perhaps after those discussions, Mr. Pink, we can talk about council or planning or whatever. Okay. So if everybody's good with that. Okay. Thank you. All right. We are now on to site plans, plans of subdivision, et cetera. And this is for uh, R&M Clark Holdings. And Mr. Sharp, I believe you're back on again. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. The next applications to be heard are site plan application SPA-61-20 in the uh, name of r and Clark Holdings Incorporated. This application has been submitted concurrently with cash in lieu of parking application CP-01-21. Also in the name of r and Clark Holdings Incorporated. The applications have been uh, submitted concurrently as I had indicated. The subject property is known municipally as 116 uh, Medora Street here in Port Carling. The proposed development involves a commercial office addition that will connect two existing commercial office buildings. The resultant building will be approximately 3,600 square feet in size, including the second story portion of the proposed addition and a proposed covered porch off the front or street facing side of the, the building. The applicant has submitted an application to give payment in lieu of five of the required parking spaces. 11 parking spaces are required in total, whereas six are proposed, including one uh, required barrier-free parking space. David Thaler, Development Engineering Coordinator, Coordinator with the District's Engineering and Public Works Department, has provided detailed comments. Mr. Thaler has advised that a lot grading plan is required to be reviewed by district staff, and staff have recommended a condition to formalize uh, Mr. Thaler's request. Tim Sopko, the township's public works technician, has advised that the township's public works department has an interest in stormwater management details and staff can ensure that the public works department has an opportunity to review and comment on those details when they become available. I have prepared a detailed report for your consideration and if committee is considering recommending approval of the application, staff have recommended a number of conditions relating to stormwater management, lot grading, exterior lighting, and a requirement for approval of the application of the applicant's cash in lieu of parking application. I have no further comments at this time and I'd be happy to answer any questions from committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. And I know that Mr. Clark is here. If we could bring him in, Jane, or is he's here? So Bob, I don't know if you can hear me yet. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Um, okay, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate uh, uh, appreciate your consideration this morning. Um, 
So uh, this building are the two small buildings down at uh, 116 Medora, oh, sorry, uh, Bob Clark, 1140 Marinas Road, Port Carling, Ontario, P0B1J0. Um, this property, uh, I have rented it for four years. Um, most recently just purchased the buildings as we were running out of space, talked to the landlord about either expanding buildings or um, my need to find other accommodation in Port Carling. Um, that actually isn't an option. Uh, there isn't really commercial space available on a 12 month basis. So this property, uh, one building, um, my real estate business operates out of the second building uh, is my construction business. Uh, both buildings are uh, very old, uh, poorly constructed, although we did tidy them up and uh, uh, do small sort of internal uh, renovations and really cosmetic work on them um, when we first moved in. But uh, structurally, unfortunately, they're best uh, used as uh, housing for mice. <laughs> so um, at this point, it, they really require some pretty significant work. Um, so I've been working extensively with um, the planning group, Bryce in particular, and your subcontract planning group, uh, MHBC, uh, West Crown and uh, Tyler Searles um, to come up with a plan that uh, would really uh, hopefully complement uh, what's going on uh, in the streetscape in Port Carling um, and, and frankly do as little impact to the current environment of this lot as we could. Um, and just an example of that, this lot's 360 feet deep um, behind the small building at the back, which is the construction office. There's basically a granite face that goes um, almost 200 feet back. Um, we are, um, you know, going ahead with the plan and the design where we're not going to be blasting back into that rock and removing all of those trees, um, which, you know, has happened uh, along that same stretch of the street um, and was sort of quite disruptive to the area. So I'm trying to work within the footprint that's available. Um, the cost of that, by the way, is by not blasting backwards, I can't meet your parking requirement. And that's why uh, there's a cash in lieu of, um, because uh, I would actually, to be able to meet the requirement based on the square footage that we require to operate our business and for the building that needs to be built, um, I'd have to blow back into the rock, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 40 to 50 feet. Um, so we've um, chosen not to do that. Um, as I mentioned, uh, staff has supported the requirements. We've worked with them on the design. Um, the only trees that will be removed is where there is addition uh, to join the two buildings. Uh, the majority of those trees are quite small. Uh, we're going to have to do some retaining um, of the driveway next to me, which is a, um, a dental office. Uh, we will take that work on. Uh, we've uh, hired Pinestone to do our stormwater management uh, study. I hope to have that any day. They've already done the surveying. Um, we are going to meet all other requirements of the township. Um, there is one note on here. Uh, it's not a big deal, but I'm not really sure where it came from that the maximum height of the building would be 29 feet. On my site plan document, it says that the, um, uh, we have the ability to go to 40 feet. And I believe that is the acceptable number uh, for um, C3 zoning. Um, so I would just ask that we revisit that. Um, we really need the space uh, just from the perspective of uh, we don't have enough space for the people that we have. And unfortunately, we have to create our own. Everything in Steamboat Bay is, um, you know, really summer, uh, uh, only summer occupiable because it doesn't have heat and water. Um, and the only other uh, the only other thing I would ask is uh, and I'm not even sure if this is possible, but you know, based on the amount of time it's taken to be able to um, come up with a plan and something that would be uh, hopefully agreeable. Uh, you know, um, this space, I actually, we're, we're mainly a summer running business. So tearing down um, likely the back building um, means I'm going to have even less space in the summer. So if there's any way to expedite this, meaning 
is it possible to delegate this approval to staff uh, if all conditions are are met? Um, then uh, that would be greatly appreciated so that when this uh, state of emergency is over, I could get a building permit and get working on this. And uh, beyond that, I'm happy to answer any questions and thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Um, uh, committee, any questions, any comments? All right, I don't see any. Oh, I do by, by Councillor Roberts. Oh, and, and oh, okay, Councillor Roberts first. Thank you. And just before I begin, Madam Chair, the hands are still there. If you go under participants to the far side, you'll see three dots. And under the three dots is raise your hand. So for those that may be having difficulty finding. And thank you, Madam Th Chair, through you. Um, the, uh, this is, uh, I'm, I'm supportive of this. I'm more concerned about the, um, um, of the parking. And um, uh, I, when I see the pictures, there's six, six vehicles parked on the uh, subject property. And I'm just wondering um, how we can, uh, how we're gonna address parking in, in that area because in the summer it's flooded and uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't be objective, uh, have any objection to getting this through as soon as possible. So we don't impact parking um, in the summertime. That's all I have today. Thank you. Uh, okay, Councillor Roberts. Um, Councillor Nishikawa. Today. Sorry. Um, I guess I, I was a little bit concerned about the comment that Mr. Clark brought forward about the height of the building. I am actually comfortable with staff uh, dealing with this uh, going forward as far as, um, you know, dealing with the parking and, and in lieu ofs and things. Um, I, I just was curious about there seemed to be a misunderstanding about the height of the building. And if, if uh, staff could comment on that, please. Mr. Sharp. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. Uh, yeah, I can do my best to try to clarify. I think uh, really all it was is that uh, Mr. Clark had indicated a height of 29 feet on the face of the application for site plan approval. Um, I think we've always been under the understanding that the uh, building will comply. There was no specific uh, elevation indicated on the uh, uh, elevation renderings that were submitted, but uh, we do have the note on the site plan indicating that the maximum height for the zone is, is 40 feet. Uh, hopefully that uh, clarifies. And just to, uh, to speak to um, the parking concern, um, the property is located in the uh, core commercial area of Port Carling and the official plan is generally supportive of reduced parking standards uh, um, within that area. Um, as we've indicated in our in our uh, in our report, the proposed parking lay layout does uh, comply with um, um, parking requirements. So, uh, if there's any other questions, happy to to assist. Thank you, Councillor Jaglowitz. Yes, I'm going to uh, support this application, and I'm very pleased that uh, Mr. Clark has uh, has tried to work without blasting. I think. Uh, I think that's fine, and I think the concessions he's asking for are reasonable. Okay, any other comments? Uh, Councillor Jag or uh, Councillor Zavitz. I think we're going to get together and call it the Jagla Zavitz, but uh, let's start for another day. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, listen, I too, too totally support uh, this and uh, Mr. Clark and his endeavors. I sat in the dentist chair at Port Carling Dentistry on Monday morning and looked straight down um, at his property. What a bizarre, uh, you know, physical space area. So, I mean, he's, I think he's done a great job of working within the confines of rock and, uh, you know, varied elevations. So I, I certainly support this. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to, then I see no other comments. I'm going to read this, um, Mr. Pink, in order to delegate this to the staff, does that have to be part of this? Just, just to keep everything. 
Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, we'll look after that part too. Um, Councillor Mazan, are you here? Yes, I am. I'm just having some uh, broadband issues. So it's just easier, <laughs> okay. but I have been listening. Thank you. No, that's good. Uh, you're on the motion. That's why we had to ensure that you're oh, yes, still with us. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. We're just uh, adding a little section to this. And once we approve this, staff can move forward with it. Hopefully, our state of emergency is lifted fairly soon, Mr. Clark, and you can continue on. Um, it can anyone? Oh, can you hear me? Yes. May I, may I just ask one last question and I appreciate the support and, and uh, uh, thank you very much. There was one open question, I think, and that question had to do with the height of the building. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's a small lot and a thin lot, I don't want, uh, it, will it will not be 40 feet. Um, I think it would look silly. I think we've heard things about wedding cakes and stuff and I don't plan on being in one. So, um, my my request would be uh if if it can possibly happen here um could we put a maximum height on this i'll restrict myself to 35 feet and the only reason i need that requirement is it's industrial space and i've been talking to my hvac designer and our intention is to be using uh the the aluminum uh, or sorry the sta galvanized stainless venting and that has to sit roughly three feet, two to three feet off the ceiling into the building. So I just don't want people banging their heads around as they're going through this place. So if, if it's not possible, I'll, I'll, I'll find another way, but uh, it would be preferable. Okay, thank you. Mr. Sharp, what is the max that, that um, Mr. Clark can have on this without, within our, our um, regulations? Thank you, Chair Bridgman. It's uh, 40 feet, so there is no need to uh, restrict the height unless, of course, committee feels there is a need to restrict it to 35 feet, as Mr. Clark has indicated, but uh, otherwise we can just work with Mr. Clark at the staff level to get this done. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you. Oh, Councillor Edwards? Uh, yes, thank you to the Chair. Um, I'm glad to see that, that, uh, and that the applicant and that Mr. Clark would say 35 feet. And I really hope he keeps it to that because uh, when you're in uh, Port Carter, you don't need those, as he said, those uh, those cakes. So, uh, and that I, I would be happy with that. But we'll leave it up to the the uh, the uh, planning department on the site plan approval. Hey, I can see wedding cake is going to be a new buzzword around here. Okay, moving right along. I uh, moved by Councillor Zavitz, seconded by Councillor Mazan. Be it resolved that planning committee recommend to township council the site plan application SPA-61-20 RM Clark Holdings Inc. be approved subject to the following conditions. The stormwater management and site grading details be provided to the satisfaction of the district and township, demonstrating that post-development stormwater flows match pre-development uh, stormwater flows. The receipt of securities for stormwater and grading works if required. Demonstration. Demonstration exterior lighting fixtures will be dark sky compliant and that the applicant obtains council approval to provide payment in lieu of required parking in the amount prescribed for relief from the five required spaces. If a corresponding site plan agreement has not been executed by February 10th, 2022, this approval will have been deemed to have expired and that cash in lieu of parking spaces in the amount of five spaces be approved. Okay. All right. Any discussion? All in favor? Are you good? Okay. That passes. Okay. Thank you. All right. I'm going to call a um, seven minute break. If we can come back here, we'll have a comfort break. We get back at 11. That would be great.
Okay. Um, Councillor Mazan, if you're there, would you just let us know? Councillor Edwards? Mayor Harding. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we have quorum, so yeah. we're good. All right, so we are going to continue. And our next uh, topic is, is a report from our manager of planning and a bell mobility. So Mr. Sharp, would you like to start this or do or would we like, uh, I think it's Ms. Wood to speak to this. You can, you can, okay. Oh, there he is. I believe Mr. Pink was actually going to uh, handle this one. Okay, it says manager of planning. So I'm, I'm, I am reading my script, I promise. Okay, <laughs> Ms. Mr. Pink. Thank you, Chair, uh, you are correct. Uh, we're just trying to confuse you. Um, the, uh, just very quickly, uh, Ms. Wood is uh, on the call and she does have a presentation ready to go over the finer details of this proposal, uh, but it is a uh, cell tower request in a Camel Lake area. Uh, it has, because it exceeds 100 feet in height, um, does not contain, uh, is not to contain any lights. However, it does exceed 100 feet in height. A public information meeting uh, was required. One was held digitally uh, in the fall. Uh, it was uh, fairly well attended. It was a lengthy discussion. Um, Predominantly uh, inquiries and questions were received. Uh, one uh, area resident uh, did uh, note concerns with the proposal. Uh, most inquiries were either um, general in nature or supportive of the proposal. Uh, just very um, quickly, uh, staff's preference are for monopine towers. I feel they have less of an aesthetic impact. Uh, unfortunately, this tower, um, the proponents indicate, uh, cannot be um, uh, monopine design, it would not meet their network objectives in this area, which I think is due to the lower population density and the requirement for a, a greater coverage uh, area and hence a higher tower. Uh, but I will uh, allow uh, the delegate to, uh, to speak and present uh, additional details and happy to answer any questions the committee has. Okay, thank you. All right, Ms. Wood. There she is. Uh, okay. Can, can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can. So please go ahead. Perfect. Um, so good morning, Mayor Harding, councillors, staff, and any members of the public in attendance. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, so as you mentioned, I'm Maria Wood from Canacre, 49 Queen Street East in Toronto. And I'm the planner here on behalf of Bell Mobility and I'll be speaking on Bell's behalf regarding the Camel Lake Road uh, W7717 Telecommunications Tower proposal. Um, so to quickly go through the agenda, I'll first go over the project summary, tower design and site locations. I'll then discuss the consultation process and finally the request for concurrence as we believe that Bell has fulfilled the concurrence requirements as per township policy. Bell Mobility is committed to improving wireless network coverage and capacity for businesses and residents in the Muskoka area. And Camel Lake is underserved in both cellular and internet capacity. And this tower will drastically improve network coverage and capacity in the area. And we're very excited about the opportunity to bring the improved services to your communities. Uh, so if we could go to the next slide. So first, the tower will be a steel self-support tower, 52.1 meters in height. And the tower will host the cellular network and the high-speed wireless internet to the home services. The upload and download speeds are expected to vary per location, but will generally be about 25 to 50 megabits per second download and one to 10 megabits per second upload. And we have completed a Transport Canada assessment and that entity has confirmed that no daytime lighting, nighttime lighting, or markings will be required for this proposed location. And if we could go to the next slide. So the current proposed location is best suited on the south side of Camel Lake Road. For this uh, tower proposal, we wanted to ensure that we were distanced from Camel Lake to lower any visual impact, as well as avoiding some nearby wetlands and other sensitive areas. And this location will provide service for the most amount of residents. 
um, and is suited is well suited to meet our radio frequency objectives in this area. Um, if you could go to the next slide. So next in the presentation, we have our two visual simulations. The first is on the east side of Camel Lake Road looking west. Um, that is this one here. And if you can scroll to the next one. This one is also east of the property and it is at the intersection of Camel Lake Road and Raymond Road. And you can see the tower outline just in the distance beyond the tree line. And if you can scroll to the next one. Um, so our existing and proposed coverage mapping, this slide here is the existing coverage and you can see the service area being targeted is the yellow zone, um, which has mostly poor service. For reference, the excellent service is represented by the blue, the green, uh, green is good service and the yellow is poor service. Um, so the tower, if you could scroll to the next slide, please. So the tower you can see represented by the W7717 will bring service from Camel Lake Road all the way down almost to the Falkenberg Road to the south and west to Dohedery Road, as well as east um, past Raymond Road and along Concession 2. Um, and so this proposal will fill in most of the service gaps in the area. If you could just scroll up one and then back down so that we can see the, the um, difference. Um, there is the large yellow gap and that is what we're targeting to fill here. And with the tower, it is mostly um, blue and green. So that is excellent to good coverage that will um, be part of this tower proposal. So the, if we could go to the next slide. So for our consultation process, um, along with township consultation policy, we felt that an increased consultation radius would be appropriate for this location. We expanded the radius to include all landowners within 1000 meters of the site property. Um, a total of 11 parties attended the public information meeting held on November 18th, 2020. Of all the comments we received throughout the meeting and through writing, as Mr. Pink noted earlier, we received only one resident in opposition to the location of the tower. And we have since consulted with that individual to ease some of their concerns. And if you could go to the next slide, please. So finally, I would like to reiterate that this site will bring both mobile LTE coverage and capacity along with wireless internet to the community. Bell has gone above and beyond consultation requirements to ensure that landowners are notified and invited to comment on the proposal. And I would like to thank township staff and the community for their collaboration to bring these services to the area. So at this time, I would like to request that council deliver a letter of concurrence to the Camel Lake Road W7717 proposal here today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and, uh, hang on, I just have to see who's uh, Councillor Jaglowitz. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Through you to the uh, delegation. Um, this is encouraging. I, 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 I'm going to support it, but I'm going to make a request. Um, you indicated, will this provide broadband coverage to the area? And, and I'll, I'll elaborate on that. I understand what cellular internet is. It's very expensive uh, for, for the kind of uh, um, uh, capability that's required. Um, would Bell Canada consider providing that uh, broadband coverage to that area from this tower at rates that are, are similar to those that the way Bell provides it to the three towns of Huntsville, Bracebridge, and Gravenhurst. In other words, that, and, and let, me, let me just elaborate for a second on this. I have a family in Australia and the policy in Australia is that all uh, residents should have similar access to broadband. And so how they handle it there in the towns and the cities it's, it's, it's available at a reasonable cost, but in the outlying areas, 
uh, it's provided by towers like this, but it's billed to the resident as if it was a in-town service. And is that something that Bell might consider uh, doing? So Maria, good luck with that and uh, <laughs> see how you can answer. Thank you. Um, so for this tower, as, as I did note that it is providing both the cellular services and wireless to the home internet. So for most people in this area, I believe that the internet service isn't currently available. And if you are accessing the internet, you would be using the, the cellular LTE service probably through a turbo hub. And this drastically increase, or it, it does increase rates. And so providing the internet wireless to the home services with this tower will help to possibly decrease some of those rates that people might be experiencing. Um, unfortunately, I can't quite speak to the pricing that Bell will be using with this tower. They do plan on using competitive rates, and I can certainly bring your suggestion back to the project team, but I unfortunately can't speak to um, rates that we'll be using, and they're still being finalized at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Hayes. Oh, thank you. And through you to Ms. Woods, I have two questions. Um, you know that the township would rather you use a monopine design, but I understand that the height uh, does not allow this tower to be one. What is the maximum height that a monopine can be? And the second part is, I realize that the tower is 171 feet high, um, and I'm surprised that no lights are required for aviation purposes. So um, I'm just asking the question on both of those. Thank you. Ms. Wood? Thank you for that question. Um, I'll address the lighting question first, just because it's a bit quicker. Um, so for the, the required lighting markings, we submit an application to Transport Canada. We include the elevation, how tall the tower will be, any types of cranes that we use, to for construction, so the max height that will be going up, um, and then Transport Canada determines, um, dependent on how close we are to airports, if we're on any flight paths, if if what is the probability of an airplane flying over the tower, and from from their analysis, that's what determines whether or not there is lighting or markings required. So it's not something that is done on our end; it is something that's done by Transport Canada. And for this tower, they've determined that. No, it won't be a threat to any planes at that height, and so that lighting won't be required. As for the monopine, uh, I know that's come up a few times with this project and, and some of our other towers in the area. Um, we do, uh, of course, we, we do try to use monopines when possible. We understand they are you know, more visually pleasing, especially in rural areas and cottage areas. For this particular location, um, it's difficult because there are some ranges in elevation and there are some constraints due to water features and wetlands. So the location of, of the towers in this area was constrained by that first. As well, the, the shorter the towers are, the less range they have in, in reaching residents. So if we're going to constrain um, our, the height of a tower, the, the end result is that we'll be re re reaching less people. For monopines, the general height is about 30 meters or about 100 feet. And so for the location and the service area that we're trying to reach here, uh, a 100 foot tower is not going to reach everybody. And that's, that's just kind of at the end of it, it it's not gonna service who we're looking to service. Um, and as well, monopines cannot always host uh, the wireless internet to the home. There, just because of the constraints due to the height, due to topography, um, tree coverage, the height of the tree canopy, they can sometimes be closer to the height of the monopine, and again, will restrict the service that residents will receive. So um, I think if, if you can look at the, the forecasted, the existing and proposed coverage map that was proposed in the, um, or that was in my presentation, you can see that the, the proposed coverage reaches almost the entire yellow circle that is our, our um, service area. If we were to decrease the tower height from 52 meters to 30 for a monopine, 
we would not be reaching the outer edges of that service area and anyone that was probably along Doe Hederty Road would not be receiving service. Um, people along um, Concession Road 2 would probably not be receiving service, as well as people to the south, um, I think Falcon, Falcon Bridge Road uh, is what it's called, um, would also not be receiving service. So we are trying to make sure that we really do fill in those gaps. And to do that, we need 52 meters in height for this tower. Okay, thank you, Councillor Edwards. Yes, I'm uh, in uh, uh, support of this, but I, I, I have a question. What is the policy on the, these towers if uh, they become redundant? Are they, uh, do they have to be removed? Uh, this what? I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? Yes, if you're not using the tower after a, a few years, and that, do they have to be removed? In that, is that 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 part of the uh, agreement that you 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 have? Um, the the if if the tower is found to be not not used uh, yeah. by the, the service um, users in the area, um, it can become uh, de-operationalized. Um, but we we don't find that, that happens very often. I'm, I'm not aware of any tower I've worked on ever being, you know, no longer used in the area. Usually, especially with this one that does provide internet, um, it probably will be in higher demand. Okay, but what, I guess what I'm asking is the regulations, if they are not used, do they have to remove them or they just leave them sitting there? Um, I'm, I'm not actually sure of that. I can, can take that back to the project team. Um, to see if there are any federal regulations that do and in, in require the removal of a tower, uh, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure of that. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councillor Mazan. Thank you, and through you. Um, a question, Maria, from my understanding. The coverage maps, are those just... Um, the mobility, the cell coverage, or are there different maps for the broadband or the, um, the internet coverage? This one? So the, the maps that we've provided are for, they, they generally do include both the cellular and the internet coverage. The cellular coverage will be a bit broader than what we have provided and what we have provided will, um, it is, is proposed for the internet and, and then um, whatever you see will be just a bit broader for cellular. It can reach a little bit farther than the wireless to home internet can. Thank you, just a, a, just a supplemental on that. So, well, just a clarification actually. Uh, so the maps that are being shown mm -hmm. are more of the mobility mm -hmm. range, but the wireless to home probably is has less of a reach. Is that correct? I just want to make sure I'm understanding because I'm getting these questions. Sure. Yes. So, so the maps we've provided um, are are for the the wireless to home internet as as well as the cellular. But the cellular will reach a little bit farther than what is on the map. So if if you're seeing yourself in the blue, then you'll get internet as well as cellular. But if you're seeing yourself you know, maybe you're just outside of the blue, you'll probably get, um, you know, marginal internet, but you might still get excellent service in cellular. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Councillor Jaglowitz. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I had a second question that I forgot to ask and, that, and, and that's to the delegate again. Um, I think you're probably aware that the federal provincial governments are providing some funding opportunities to expand broadband coverage in unserviced areas. Do you know if Bell is receiving that funding for this project? And that ties into my earlier question uh, as to whether um, if you are, if Bell is receiving it, have they put some conditions on it to, to make the cost affordable? Ms. Wood? 
So this tower is being completely funded by Bell. There, there is funding out there, but um, most of the towers that, that I personally am working on um, are only funded by Bell themselves. And so that's why some of the rates that you might see um, that might be lower in other areas are, are going to be competitive to Bell because it is being completely funded by Bell. Uh, Councillor Roberts. Yes, just a very quick, uh, Madam Chair, uh, to the um, to Mrs. Wood or Miss Wood. Um, just to follow up to Councillor uh, Edwards's question, but the, I guess the specific question is: when technology replaces the services or improves the service on a monopine or a large tower like this, is there part of the contract that within some uh, such a period of time? X months, X years, that these um, these uh, towers will be removed. And that's the question I would like you to take back to your management team. Okay. So, uh, sorry, I Councillor Roberts. Could you um, send uh, Director Pink that answer? Because I think we're probably all interested in that. And then I would ask him just to, to send out an email to us. So once you get that answer, would you mind? Sure. And if I might just speak to that uh, quickly, we do for, for every tower that we create, and especially for this one, um, the land that we develop it on is leased from a private land owner. So at, there's just going to be a certain time when that lease runs up. Um, so I would assume that if we aren't using the tower, the lease will eventually run up and we probably will remove it. But I, I don't know how long that will be or how many years that will take. Okay, well, seeing no other questions, Ms. Wood, I just have, I have a quick uh, lighter comment. Maybe you could take back to your um, pleasing scenery department. If you've got these huge towers going up, maybe we could have some fun with them and make it look like the Eiffel Tower or, or um, the Leaning Tower of Pizza. And then we'll have another reason to come to Muskoka. So it's just a thought. So, okay. I am going to read this motion as I see nothing else. Um, moved by Councillor Roberts, seconded by Councillor Zavitz. Be it resolved that planning committee recommend to council that a support resolution slash letter of concurrence be provided for proposed Bell Mobility Telecommunication Tower CT-05-20 W7717 and a copy be forwarded to Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada. Any comments? Committee, all those in favor? My screen is frozen. Oh, everybody's hand is up. It's unanimous, Madam Clerk. Can, can you see her? Sorry guys, we're having some frozen screens here. Are we good? Okay, we're good, thank you. That carries. Thank you, Ms. Wood, you have your letter. Okay, so we are now uh, nothing in heritage and attainable housing or development services or unfinished business. LPAT status, any comments, Mr. Pink? Any updates you'd like to tell us about? Just quickly, I, I, I believe I maybe failed to mention this uh, appeal at the December meeting. It was received, I think, just prior to the December meeting. Um, just to advise committee, you may recall an application for uh, a boat lift in the name of Coston Gormley, uh, where a neighboring property owner was concerned with the visual impact of that uh, boat lift. It increased the width of their docks. Um, and uh, committee council did refuse that application. The property owner uh, did appeal that. So we have received that appeal. And also we have received uh, a decision from the LPAT on the butcher zoning bylaw amendment. You may recall that application in the general Torrance area. Uh, the property uh, owner constructed a number of additions uh, to the boathouse cottage without building permits that exceeded lot coverage uh, as well as some setback issues. Um, a uh, decision was reached that did approve of that development uh, require uh, subject to the removal of a garage on the property, uh, which did uh, fairly considerably reduce the, the lot coverage, as well as uh, imposing site plan control to gain some uh, plantings along the shoreline. So those are um, 
to uh, one appeal and one decision we did receive in the last approximate month. If committee has any questions on other LPAT matters, um, so I'd like to do my best to provide you an update. Okay, any questions on LPAP matters? Committee? Mayor Harding? Uh, thank you, through you to David. David, the butcher appeal uh, or the LPAT decision, I'm just trying to remember, maybe you can help. Um, didn't we offer for them to remove the garage and that was rejected? I'm trying to remember where we netted out, just to understand sort of high level. Mr. Pink? Yes, I believe uh, through the uh, council process, they did make that offer when it went from planning committee to council. I believe council did not agree. Uh, however, that was the uh, ultimate uh, uh, settlement and decision by, by LPAP. Councillor Jaglowitz. I, I'm just going to chime in there. Uh, I, I, my recollection um, through you, Chair, to Mr. Pink, uh, is that uh, they offered, that was offered, then it was withdrawn when they went to LPAT. And I think we as, uh, and maybe I shouldn't, maybe, Maybe I have to be careful what I say. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'll leave it at, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? No? Oh, all right. Um, then I believe we're on to new business and Mr. Pink would just like to speak to the government regulate new government regulations that came down yesterday. Thank you, Chair. I'm sure committee's heard of the uh, announcement. I think it was two days ago now. Uh, by Premier Ford on the, uh, uh, the latest uh, changes to uh, provincial rules uh, as a result of this pandemic. Just wanted to quickly touch base so that committee is aware of the impacts on the Development Services Department. Uh, with respect to uh, the planning function, uh, un, uh, uh, not like the previous lockdown that happened uh, last year, uh, where the uh, uh, Planning Act timelines were essentially frozen. Uh, that does not appear to be the case uh, in this latest set of regulations. As you can tell, we're obviously still sitting here in a meeting. So I think uh, it is largely status quo uh, with respect to planning matters and we can continue to circulate applications and have meetings digitally as we are doing. Uh, with respect uh, to the building permit uh, or the building function, um, similar to the lockdown that happened uh, approximately a year ago, um, the, uh, uh, the announcement from the province outlines a number of essential services and does provide extensive detail on construction activities. Uh, our interpretation currently is that uh, building permits will no longer be able to be issued um, as a result uh, because residential construction where a permit is not in hand is not an essential uh, service or activity at this time. Uh, I would note two things, however. Uh, the building uh, team will continue to receive applications, will continue to review them, and as soon as uh, this latest uh, order is lifted, uh, we'll be in a position to release uh, those building permits, so hopefully lessening any uh, impacts on the construction industry. I would also note uh, that we are certainly reaching out to the province to get clarification. A number of the uh, chief building officials in the district I have a lot of questions uh, on the latest announcements. I think uh, the entire province likely does, and we are seeking clarification to be sure, uh, but it does appear uh, that most agree uh, that uh, building permits uh, are no longer going to be issued uh, until we receive further direction uh, from the province. Um, so just wanted to update uh, committee on those announcements with respect to development services. Again, if there are any questions, I will do my best to answer those. Uh, Mayor Hardin. Uh, thank you. Just to uh, further David's comment, um, I reached out yesterday to uh, Norm Miller's office to try and get some clarification. I think the one big question is that around the construction industry, uh, what can uh, permit, what's not allowed to, what's considered essential. Uh, they have revised the regulations from the springtime. I've actually forwarded to the CAO and Mr. Pink uh, during this meeting because I heard back during this meeting from uh, Norm's office. Um, the specific details of what is considered essential and not essential in that construction industry. Um, so we'll uh, circulate that to ourselves as well, but obviously our uh, department will be able to uh, follow up with uh, regulations accordingly. And I think the simple word is, unless you have to go out, you know, and having to go outside, if you want to go for a walk, 
you need to get some fresh air, then that's certainly permissible. But otherwise, unless it's a medical or dental appointment or food service type of thing, um, we're basically supposed to stay inside our homes. Right. Okay. Uh, any other new business committee? Well, if there is none, then I'm going to read the motion to adjourn. Moved by Councillor Zavitz, seconded by Councillor Kelly. Be it resolved that planning committee adjourn at 11.33 a.m. And the next, excuse me, the next regular meeting of planning committee be held on Thursday, February 11th, 2021 at 9 a.m. Electronically from the council chambers, municipal offices in Port Carling, Ontario. All in favor? Okay, it carries. All right. Well, as the theme goes uh, this week, see you all tomorrow at nine a.m. And Cheryl, I'll do I'll do that form right away, Cheryl. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.